folks, I'm going to start the forum just a few minutes early. And with, uh, with a heavy heart, I have a sad announcement. The gentleman up on the screen is a gentleman named uh, Gary Olson. And uh, sadly, he passed since we last convened. Gary Olson served the forum in so many ways. It's, uh, it's really astounding. He was our webmaster. He provided technical guidance, managed the server. He did so many things for the forum, and sadly his wife Anne lost him. So to memorialize that, I'm going to play a, a quick YouTube video, and then we'll convene a regular program. Uh, and I ask that uh, if you're interested, I printed out envelopes for two uh, uh, organizations that Gary was fond of. One was Oregon Dog Rescue, and he was also a graduate of Eastern Oregon College, and their Staircase, Staircase Foundation is uh, if anyone would like to make a donation on his behalf would be an appropriate way to remember him as well. That being said, I'm going to start a quick YouTube video. Uh, wa please watch that and then we'll start our program. This is going to be a video about stacking a cord of wood into a 8 foot by 5 foot by 5 foot tall cube and doing it in such a way that the whole thing doesn't fall down. Okay, so the first thing you need to do for your to, to, to build the foundation for doing your, your firewood cube is you have to build like a, a foundation. And what I do is I put it on these concrete blocks, which you can get, you know, like at any lumber yard or, or a place like that. I take the cubes and I put them in a pattern that's kind of like the, the structure that you're going to have. So you're going you're gonna to build a frame that is like 5 feet by 8 feet. And you do that by taking four by fours and you put four by four in each over these are these are set in rows of three and three. And so you take and you put four by fours over them and you're building basically a a box. Then you know, those are those those four by fours are made out of um, well they're four by fours and they're five feet long and then I have two by sixes that are these are seven feet but you know eight feet would probably be better and you put the, the two by sixes or two by fours those work just as well and you set them you know, with a space between each one, and that way, you know, there will be air to circulate between your wood, and it will keep, help it, you know, burn better in the winter time. And so, what you do is you just keep adding these until you have a pallet that you set your wood on. You know, your firewood on here, and we'll, we'll stack it this way. And then the real trick is the corners, and that's what I'll be showing you next. Okay, I would say that the most important part in building your wood pile is the corners, because this, this is where, this is, the, this is the secret that keeps them from falling down. And what you do is you, you, you find basically logs that have been cut in half, because they're, they're the most stable. And then you crisscross them, you know, two this way, two that way, two this way, and you keep doing that. And you do that all the way across on your edge, and you do that on both sides. And as you're stacking your wood, you, you keep in mind where, where, where these are, because you take the, the other kind of shapes and you put them in the middle, but as you find these, you always stack them toward the end. So I'll be showing you kind of more of how that works later on. But this is the basic principle. And also if you can kind of lean them toward the inside a little bit, you know, because it's, it, it's, it's fairly stable. And the more weight it gets on it, the more stable it gets. And it's amazing, you know, that you can get this thing like five feet high and the whole thing doesn't fall over. So that's the secret. Okay, and just to kind of give you a, a better idea, this is the this is the corner of the beginning of the wood pile, and you can see the crisscross, and um, and that's going to be the pattern. I'll be crisscrossing on the end, both ends with the wood stacked in the middle, and you can probably see a tiny bit now that the crisscross ones are leaning a little bit in toward the middle. So 
Um, anyway, that's what that looks like, and we'll just kind of show you more as the wood pile goes up. Okay, another important thing to keep in mind is as you're un as you're stacking your wood, you're going to come across some oddball pieces that look, you know, something like this that won't stack real well, and you know, pull those off to the side because they're just going to, you know. They're going to just mess up your whole stack, so you, you kind of just save those to the back, to the end, and, and then throw those on the top. If you've got a piece like this that just kind of has a little thing sticking down, sometimes you can find a place in your stack where you know it'll it'll fit in like that, and that'll be okay, and you know, and then it can make it you know a nice a nice tight a tight fit. So that's kind of important if you have pieces that are on unusual shape, save them and then just toss them on the top. Okay, the wood pile is finished and it's about four and a half feet at its highest point and it's like really solid, so it could even go taller than that. Um, but it's basically a, a good solid wood pile and the secret is basically uh, kind of practice and experience and how to kind of put the wood together. But the basic techniques I've shown you uh, should make it so that you could do a nice solid wood pile if that's what you're inclined to do. So here's, uh, here's the picture of the final product. Folks, welcome to the Washington County Public Affairs Forum. Today we've got Bully Commissioner Brad Avakian, who I personally think is one of the best public speakers this organization has ever seen. From someone who has to edit the TV show following the presentation, he pronounces and articulates and things that you guys don't care about, such as microphone technique, make my job easy. And so it's a pleasure to have him back. Uh, I'd also like to welcome all three candidates for Beaverton City Council position one. And they will present in the following order. Lacey Beatty is up first, followed by uh, incumbent Ian King and third, Alton Harvey. Uh, the format is going to be as follows. Uh, we're going to spend about 20 to 25 minutes with Brad first. He'll speak briefly and then we'll take the balance of his time with Q&A. And then the second half of the program we will devote to the position one candidates. They will each be given six minutes. I ask that only forum members ask questions at the microphone. That is your purchased privilege right. The forum is open to the public. You need not spend money with the restaurant. You're welcome to walk in off the street. But if you want to ask a question at the microphone, you must be a member. I'd like to uh, ask that if you ask a question, you keep it under 30 seconds. And candidates and esteemed uh, Bully Commissioner Radovakian, please keep your responses to one minute or less. With that being said, I ask for one thing from you. Please, may I have a warm round of applause for Bully Commissioner Radovakian. Thanks, Eric. That was very nice. And uh, uh, thanks uh, once again to the forum for inviting me to come uh, spend an afternoon with you. Uh, you know, I want to share uh, a few things with you that we're, we're doing at the Bureau that I, I thought would be very important to you. But I'm going to keep my remarks a uh, little shorter uh, than, than normal. The last couple times, if you've invited me down, you've had many more questions than the time even allowed for. And uh, and so I'm going to save plenty of time at the end for you to ask questions and for us to just uh, have a good discussion about whatever it is uh, that's on your mind. Uh, you know, as Labor Commissioner, it's my job to protect workers on the job in Oregon, uh, to see that people are kept free from discrimination, to help support the success of Oregon businesses, and to make sure that we have got the best trained, most ready workforce that you can find anywhere. Uh, in last year alone at the Bureau, uh, we fielded about 60,000 calls from Oregonians that had questions about their rights on the job or in housing. Uh, that meant about 5,000 formal investigations for people that felt that they had been treated unfairly. And in recent years, that's meant about $20 million back into the pockets of workers who had been shorted their wages on the job or otherwise treated unfairly. And in addition to that, uh, I have also barred uh, over 120 uh, corporations in Oregon from working on public taxpayer-funded projects that we have found were ripping off their workers on the job. These enforcement efforts are important. 
because everybody deserves a fair shot at a job and to be treated fairly once they have the job. Uh, but many of our complaints uh, don't just come from workers. They come from businesses that understand how important it is for them to be able to compete on a level playing field and not have to compete with businesses that are skirting the state laws in order to gain an unfair advantage. So our enforcement efforts have proven to be good not only for Oregon workers, but to be good for Oregon businesses as well. But some of our most important work doesn't have to do with the enforcement side of what we do. To support Oregon's families and to help Oregon's businesses be as successful as they can, we must add living wage jobs and grow our economy in Oregon. Now there is no shortcut to building a strong middle class. But the way to do it is to prove to the world that we do have the best trained and most ready workforce that you can find anywhere. And that starts with one of our top priorities, the return of 21st century shop classes to our middle schools and high schools. Now, not long ago, I told you that we were ready to head down this path. But now, just after a little less than a year and a half of the effort, we've restored 21st century shop classes to over 160 middle schools and high schools in the state of Oregon. That's brought these new career education classes to over 90,000 Oregon students. Now I'm talking about the traditional crafts like wood shop and metal shop and welding, the kind of things you think about when you think of a shop class. But look at Joseph Oregon doing advanced manufacturing with computer-aided design software, pre-med sports medicine in Silverton, renewable energy and sustainability in the Eugene schools, and next year, Washington County and through the Beaverton School District is going to do biomedical engineering. This is the face of a 21st century shop class today. And we are not going to stop until every middle school and high school student in the state of Oregon has got access to one of these great career education courses. And I have to tell you this too. When these shop classes are back, we're going to do the same exact thing with music and art programs. Now, we also have to make sure that we take care of our lowest wage earners. Now, Oregonians got it right in 2002 when through a voter passed initiative, we tied our minimum wage to the consumer price index so that our lowest wage earners never fall behind the rising cost of goods and services. And others across the nation have recognized our success in doing that in Oregon. About a year ago, Senator Tom Harkin from Iowa called, asked if uh, I could come and share our successful experience with his Senate committee, because Senator Harkin had a bill to tie the federal minimum wage to the consumer price index modeled uh, after uh, much in the way after Oregon uh, has done it. And I was pleased to do it, because not only has uh, our method of increasing the minimum wage been good for workers, but because of the additional consumer purchasing power uh, that it has garnered, it's been good for local businesses as well. You see, minimum wage workers are not socking away their money in mutual funds and 401ks. Virtually every dime they earn is spent on gasoline and food and school supplies for their kids. And that money is spent in local businesses. As an example, when I announced just the modest 15 cent per hour increase uh, this year, that equated to about $23 million in additional consumer purchasing power that went to local businesses. But we also have to recognize the minimum wage for what it really is. The old stereotype of a high school kid working a few hours after school to get a little bit of pocket change just is not the reality anymore. Today, the minimum wage worker is likely a woman in her 30s. She's working full time and she might even have kids at home. And that's important to recognize when we know that every minimum wage in the country, every state minimum wage, including Oregon's, is below the poverty line. 
Well, it's been 12 years since we have had a discussion about our minimum wage in Oregon. And while it is uh, important to keep it tied to the consumer price index, I think that it's time that Oregon have another discussion about whether any family that is working full time should be living in poverty. So I say let's give hardworking families a better wage and let's help lift our Oregon families above the poverty line. Now, as always, uh, I appreciate the Washington County Public Affairs Forum uh, hosting these great community discussions on important issues like uh, the minimum wage. Uh, and I want to thank you once again for inviting me to spend uh, the lunch in with you. And I think with that, um, I'll stop and let's see what it is that's on your minds. Jim Cape, former member. This, uh, a question about like the um, cake wedding situation or whatever. There's a comedy cliche from the Phil Henry radio show where they have a character who's a wedding photographer who chooses not to photograph um, unphotogenic couples. So I mean, is, is that discrimination? And another point, if, if there's an auto mechanic who prefers to deal with Asian cars, is that discrimination? Thank you. Well, in, in Oregon, uh, you know, the law is that you cannot discriminate against people based on race, religion, gender, disability, age, uh, sexual orientation. Uh, and uh, uh, in the one case that, that, you, that you mentioned, you know, everybody's got the right to believe what they want to believe uh, with respect to their own spiritual beliefs. Um, uh, but that doesn't mean that you can't skirt around the law. Uh, and in that particular case, the Bureau of Labor and Industries investigated, found that the, the bakery had violated the law by discriminating against people based on sexual orientation. And uh, very soon, if that case doesn't settle, it will, uh, it will be going to hearing. Chris Leslie, forum member. Brad, I was listening to the news, and they say there's a problem of deflation in Europe. Now on making these automatic uh, increases tied to the uh, consumer price index, if it goes down, will you lower the benefits or the uh, salary caps, things like that, mm -hmm. so we don't have another bubble? The way the minimum wage works in, in Oregon uh, is that uh, uh, e every year when the consumer price index comes out, uh, we calculate uh, whether or not there's going to be an increase, and if so, then the minimum wage increases at the corresponding rate to the consumer price index. And in fact, um, that's been a very valuable tool for Oregon businesses because ahead of the next year coming, you can contemplate what your expenses are going to be in the next year and you can, can plan for them. Uh, uh, it's my decision that if the consumer price index goes down, uh, that I will not decrease the minimum wage. Uh, and that's for two reasons. One, I don't think our lowest wage earners who barely earn enough money to put food on the table, let alone provide for education or health care or any of the other things that really are necessities of life, should take a hit in a tough economic time. And the second is, uh, it is just necessary for our local businesses to have families with consumer purchasing power that continue buying things. And I hear that from our local businesses all the time. So I don't want to hobble local businesses by taking away the consumer purchasing power that helps keep them strong. Well, Brad, uh, thank you so much for uh, being here. Um, I have, uh, I'm thinking a little bit about some things that are happening kind of in the Portland area. And uh, that deals with longshoremen and uh, ships coming in to load their cargo and, and uh, go out to other countries. Um, so my question is, um, does Foley work with the longshoremen, their unions and things like that to make, because there's been quite a bit of uh, movement right now about whether or not the um, companies are going to come in because they couldn't seem to reach an agreement. Do you have any, uh, anything to do with any of that? Well, what, uh, what, what John is asking me about is a labor dispute at our, our port that looked like it uh, stood the potential of disrupting commerce coming into the port. I was very glad to see Hanjin 
uh, decide to continue uh, uh, shipping uh, to, to our port. That was a very positive, uh, positive thing for our local economy. With respect to the Bureau of Labor and Industries, uh, we don't uh, have direct involvement in those types of, of labor disputes. And in fact, if a group has a collective bargaining agreement, that oftentimes is the law for them. And many of the wage and hour uh, and employment laws that we enforce are geared uh, even more towards folks that don't have contracts like a collective uh, bargaining agreement. Uh, but the one very good piece of news, John, from what you bring up is that Hanjin decided to keep shipping here, and that's that's good for our workers and our businesses both. Uh, good afternoon, Commissioner. Uh, Lee Coleman, member of the forum. Uh, on the subject of helping low-wage workers, what do you suggest might be done with employers who deliberately pay low wages and help their new employees augment income by applying for federal benefits, uh, such as food stamps. Is there anything that we can do under state law to uh, help those employers improve the situation? Well, let me answer the question in two ways, Lee. Um, you know, employers have got to pay at least the minimum wage. And if you don't pay at least the minimum wage, you run afoul of Oregon law, and that's one of the reasons you've got a Bureau of Labor and Industries to hold those employers accountable and protect workers. <clears throat> but with respect to paying a fair wage, with respect to paying a living wage so that people don't have to live on any type of government subsidy in order to provide the basic essentials uh, for a family, we're very lucky in Oregon to have businesses that really do go the extra mile in paying good salaries and providing benefits, uh, including a retirement, and we're very, we're very fortunate. And I, I would hate to see uh, any Oregon company artificially decrease wages in order to have people, I think is what you were implying, survive for them and their families on some type of government subsidies. It's just not something that I have seen out of Oregon uh, employers. Thank you for being with us, Brad. I'm Karen Bolin. I'm president of the Aloha Business Association. I ask my question in regards to women that want to work and find that child care is $1,000 um, a week or a month, depending upon how many kids they have. Um, that's the greatest challenge, I think, for the women that want to get out of the home and work full time and have children. And so I'm wondering, how can the Bureau of Labor encourage businesses and employers to maybe pay a fair living wage but also offer some kind of a child care assistance and make that tax deductible or make it make it an incentive for the business to want to help in that area Do you know what i'm saying i do know what you're saying um you know uh, uh several years ago uh i uh, brought together some civil rights-minded uh, folks, created the Oregon Council on Civil Rights to help chart a course for Oregon by getting ahead of the curve on important civil rights matters for the state. And the first task I gave them was equal pay for equal work. You see, women in Oregon still only earn about 79 cents on the dollar compared to men. People of color earn even less than that. And the council just recently came back to me with their recommendations on how to eliminate the wage disparities in Oregon. And uh, what they clearly showed is that there's no single overarching solution to eliminating wage disparities and getting at the issue that, that you pose, but it clearly shows that we can do something about it. And in the upcoming uh, few months, the Bureau is going to take those recommendations, going to uh, create an action plan that we believe will in time modernize Oregon workplaces through women and family friendly policies. Things like uh, allowing flexible work schedules so that uh, parents can have time for school activities with, uh, with, uh, with, their, with their children. Um, looking at new and different ways of uh, interviewing and, um, and doing promotional uh, making promotional types of decisions on the job, eliminating the motherhood penalty so that when a woman leaves work to have a child or to raise a child, 
uh, they don't suffer by losing out on uh, promotional opportunities or seniority as they come back. All of these types of things combined, we believe, will eventually uh, put everybody on an equal footing in the, in, in the workplace. You know, something you said, though, as you were talking about families in Oregon and how well they're doing, combined with Lee's question earlier, prompted a thought. I, I, um, I was recently in, in Bend and uh, went there in part to visit a couple terrific programs they have to support their local families. One of them was called the Family Kitchen. Uh, and the Family Kitchen is a place that uh, serves over 5,000 meals a month uh, for people who uh, just need a warm place to go and, uh, and a good hearty meal to eat. And as I was touring the place, I asked them, what kind of folks do you serve here? And they said, well, they said, oftentimes we get the war veterans because we have a veterans camp right outside of Bend and they come in pretty regularly. Bend has a very high transient teen population. So they said the young folks often come in because they need, they need something to eat. And then they said something rather stunning. They said, you know, about the third week of every month, that's when we see the families of the Walmart employees. Because those folks with that employer are not earning enough money in Deschutes County to even put a plate of food on their table at the end of the month for their kids. So I'll lead back to your question, I certainly would want to see every employer in Oregon that wants to do business here with us going the extra mile to make sure that their families are earning enough money to be able to take care of the basic needs of life. Brad, that was a great response. Uh, uh, also, I want to just personally thank you. You've done an amazing job in a hyper-political situation where you've got incredible voter um, uh, concerns and very powerful business interests, and you're in the center of the storm. You navigate it well. Thank you, sir. I'd like to ask you uh, this one question for a brief response, please, and that is, in Oregon, employers are often confused about what is an employee and what is an independent contractor. Mm -hmm. I find it very amusing that I've heard on many occasions employers refer to their employees as a 1099 employee, which you and I both know is nonsensical. Can you tell me what your office does to educate both the employers and the workforce as to the difference of an employment contract and a 1099 uh, contract as well? What Eric is talking about is what oftentimes people uh, uh, characterize as a misclassification of, of workers. And, uh, you know, there are employees, there are interns, there are volunteers, there are independent contractors. And uh, for an employer that wants to skirt the rules, and like I say, Oregon employers uh, generally don't, but for those that do, Misclassifying a worker from an employee to an independent contractor means you're not paying workers' comp, you're not paying your employer taxes to the state of Oregon. Uh, and sometimes employers will do that kind of a thing in order to gain an unfair advantage over their competitors that are paying the proper wages and benefits. And so we keep a very close eye out for folks that would abuse workers and abuse the competitive uh, field out there. Uh, by misclassifying workers. The state legislature did a very smart thing a couple sessions ago. It created a, um, uh, something called the Interagency Compliance uh, Network. It's the Bureau of Labor and Industries, the Attorney General's Office, uh, the Department of Revenue, and Department of Consumer and Business Services, all the agencies that would have an interest in whether or not a worker is misclassified like that. And now when we find those kind of abuses occurring, we're able to do a, uh, a comprehensive and coordinated investigation and enforcement effort with the other agencies. It's a great example of your state uh, agencies working uh, very well together. The other thing I would mention is this. It isn't always an intentional thing that leads an employer to misclassifying a worker. A lot of businesses that are trying to follow the rules uh, sometimes just need help understanding the law. And that's where the technical assistance program for employers comes in with the Bureau of Labor and Industries. We get about 20,000 calls a year from Oregon businesses that are looking for help navigating their way through complicated state and federal law. 
Uh, if there is an employer out there that has a question about whether or not an employee is 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 a uh, is an is an employee or an independent contractor, I encourage you to call the Bureau of Labor and Industries to go to our website. You just Google in Boli B O L I. Uh, and we have actually got information on the website that can help guide you to the right conclusion, too. Excellent. Uh, time's up for Brad. How about a round of applause? Thanks, everybody. Brad always brings a touch class to this forum, and sometimes we need it. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, I'd like to introduce Lacey Beatty, and a uh, reminder to all three candidates for position one, you've got six minutes, and Marilyn McWilliams, who's going to wave to the crowd here in just a second, is your timer, so please watch her for a visual cue. She'll hold up a card. So I ask that you bring a warm round of applause for Lacey Beatty. All right, lucky me, I get to follow Brad. <laughs> so This is twice this month I followed Brad, so... Um, my name's Lacey Beatty. I'm a candidate for Beaverton City Council. And in the last three months since deciding to run, I've had close to 100 meetings with uh, community elected leaders like Catherine Harrington, Marion McWilliams, Betty Bodie, uh, Tobias Reed, fellow veteran Jeff Barker, business leaders like Don Beachy and Ken Madden, and community leaders like Marv Doty and Jim McCrite, who all seem to kind of have the same question. Why did I want to run for city council? From the tone, I often thought they were looking for a moment. When the clouds parted, so to speak, and this divine voice spoke down to me and said, this is your reason for running, I didn't have a moment like that. Rather, I've spent my entire adult life in a service to country capacity. My call to action started 10 years ago when I was a young soldier in the early days of the Iraq War. It was a hard year. The days were long, the nights were longer, and unlike wars of the past, we didn't know who the enemy was. I felt unsafe for 365 days. I was trained as a combat medic, so I got to treat our nation's heroes in their most vulnerable moments, when they were sick, when they were injured, and sometimes right before they paid the ultimate sacrifice. The message was clear. It was make it worth it. They didn't talk to me about their cars. They didn't talk to me about their life. They talked to me about their family and wanting people back home to know they died in a war that we still remembered. It was a hard year. I drove an ambulance. I slept under that ambulance for months at a time. I took a shower with a water bottle. Sorry. <laughs> it was a war-torn country where you didn't know up from down. During that year, I was there during the bush Kerry election, I held voters forums outside my ambulance, and I talked to fellow soldiers about the, the responsibility of voting. We were there during the first Iraqi election where women, yes, women, were literally sacrificing their life for the right to vote. Today, in Afghanistan, Afghani men and women have been in line for three days to register to vote, and the very first election in 10 years that NATO's not been in charge of. Because the risk of not voting for a better Afghanistan or better Iraq was just not an option. I was sent to war unprepared. I sat in a chow hall in Germany and listened to Donald Rumsfeld on TV say, we go to war with the army we have and not the army we want. Which is why when I sat across from the Beaverton Police Association, they wholeheartedly endorsed me because my, my life was compromised for money. And I told them I would never compromise their life for money. It's the reason the fire department came out and rescued me. I understand that we don't control their budget, but we must protect those that protect us because you never know when a knock on your door will be needed. After my service to the country was completed, we decided to move to Beaverton, Oregon because it was the safest city in the Pacific Northwest. And we wanted to feel whole again. My husband and I, who is a fellow combat veteran, wanted to feel safe in our home. And luckily, Beaverton gave us the greatest gift of all. It gave us time to recover, and it gave us safety. What the military does a poor job of is helping soldiers like me integrate back into society. They, there's no class. There's no training. And I was feeling 
lost, and I was talking to a mentor, a battle buddy, what we call it in the military, and I was telling her about my loneliness and how I need to feel connected, and she gave me one simple phrase. She said, Lacey, you need to serve again. Find your way to serve again. That week, I got a flyer in the mail from the city of Beaverton looking for board and commission members, and there was something called the vision. I put in my application. I went in and interviewed with some of the most fired up citizens I'd ever met, like Mark Fagan, who's become a dear friend of mine. He was excited not only about what Beaverton was, but what Beaverton was becoming. And I wanted to be a part of that so desperately. So when they asked me to join, I was very excited. That year serving on the commission saved my life. It gave me a reason to serve again. It gave me a connection back to Beaverton. And it made Beaverton not just a place where I had another address, because my husband and I had moved 11 times in 10 years in our military service, but it gave us a home. Through the vision, I was connected to other outstanding organizations like Leadership Beaverton through the Chamber of Commerce, who later gave me an endorsement as well. I spent an entire year learning about our wonderful city. Our group project at the end of the year, we decided to have a kickball tournament for Home Plate Youth Services, Washington County's only drop-in center for youth experiencing homelessness. We raised enough money for them to hire a development director for a couple months, and Tara was able to take that, that investment and turn it into a full-time position. As a military veteran, a wife, an avid community volunteer, I care deeply about Beaverton. It's more than just a city, it's my home. I learned compassion and how to truly put others first while serving in, as a combat medic in Iraq. Now I'm seeking public office to put Beaverton first and to put this community that we call home first and to make sure it's here for generations to come. I'm Lacey Beatty, I would appreciate your vote. Thank you. I'd like to introduce Ian King. How about, a, how about some applause for Ian? Hi, I'm the current, as I said, I'm the incumbent for Beaverton City Council in position one. I was elected in May of 2010. Um, I actually had a little over one more than one term because I was uh, elected from uh, in May 18th and the late Bruce Davenport had passed on April 7th, and the city council actually elected me to fill the remainder of his spot that year. So I've actually actually had an extra six months or seven months in office compared to most people at this point in time. And I want to say when I talk about why I'm running for re-election, it's because I think things are really going well overall in Beaverton. We've done some amazing things over the past few years. Um, and it's become a really great place to call home. And it's been that way for years, but we've never really done the job as well as we have of just touting how well things are going in Beaverton. We've done a great deal of outreach. We've rebranded the city as being open for business in a way that's been very positive to the community. We hear business leaders telling us they really appreciate the efforts that are going on in the city. We've made great strides in our diversity outreach efforts throughout the community. And we're really hearing that people appreciate the changes and efforts we're making in that regard. We've done a great start at implementing our community vision and our civic plan. We've done it in manifest in ways of such passing the urban renewal, which was one of the first things that really came on when I first was uh, on the city council. That was a, uh, a huge effort on staff and local elected officials throughout the community that really worked with us to make that happen. We've done investments in our local economy in taking different investment funds and rather than sending them out to national mutual funds, we invest a lot of funds locally in local banks and businesses. And throughout all this, there's been an overriding arch of working collaboratively with different partners, whether it be business, other jurisdictions, to work together to make things happen from a community perspective. And that's one of the things that really has changed the last few years that we view even not just as the city limits, but as the community in general. We've also made some strides in developing the downtown core, the round, which has been a point of contention in the city for years. We're finally making some good strides on there. We're gonna make City Hall move there finally this July. And with the help of our partner SKB there, we're redeveloping that site and it's actually finally getting some good positive traction and that's gonna really help for, catalyze things around it. The Creekside District adjacent to that is gonna help work our downtown. That's another positive thing to be pushing forward. The Canyon Road improvements there going forward. 
And we're really finally, which is one of my close things to my heart, finally moving forward with a public safety facility, which has been just overdue for decades for this community. And it's not just even an issue, it's a community issue where we haven't had a good place for our police force or for our community to be able to rely on the services they need for emergency management and everyday issues of public safety. But and that, having said that, there's still a lot of work to do for this community. Passing the bond for the facility is going to be, a, or the bond for the facility is going to be a first step, but it's going to be a long road to getting that implemented properly. A lot of work due and policy decisions and how it impacts around it. The South Poop Mountain developments, they're coming along, and the whole southern Beaverton, and that's going to require some long-term planning and policy decisions that really are going to require a great deal of good thought and implementation. Along that, we have our long-term enterprise systems that are coming through, whether it be water, sewer, all the related systems, and including our schools. Because as much as Beaverton School District has its own entity and dwarfs Beaverton by its size and finances, they're an incredible partner as we build our community because without the proper schools, we can't go forward with a real effective future for Beaverton. So on top of all this, we also need to maintain a sound financial structure. We're going to be pushing a lot of the efforts of the city to limit. In order to make these investments for our future work, we're going to have to push the city's resources as much as we can. And it's going to require a lot of finesse and a lot of experience to know where these things go and how we can make it work. Because we, we've gone too far now. We're doing some really great things for Beaverton, and we cannot pull back because there's a great future going on. And when I want to bring my experience continuing in this capacity, I would say my two biggest incentives, one of them sitting over there, the other's in daycare. Um, I had my first term has been a whirlwind. Work. I'm finishing up my doctorate this year, and halfway through I had a boy, <laughs> or she had the boy. <laughs> I, was, <laughs> trust me, I was there, but she did all the work. And when you talk about what the incentive for me is to go forward and bring this, because I see a future for that. My little boy is going to grow up in Beaverton. He needs the schools. He needs the infrastructure. He needs a sound government, and he needs a great sense of community. And that's what we're doing, and that's when I bring my time and efforts forward in that effort because we need the experienced people, because we're heading a time now that is just going to shape us for generations to come. And I think it's a positive place to grow up, and I want to make that positive place for my boy keep going. So I'm asking you for your vote this, this May. Thank you all. Ian, excellent job. You too, Lacey. We look forward to uh, having Alton come up here. Folks, how about some applause for Alton Harvey? Thank you very much. My name is Alton Alton Harvey Sr. My, I thank my. I thank you for inviting me to participate with this forum, and I congratulate Mr. King and Ms. Vidi, and I wish them both well. My journey in service began on the plantation in Georgia, and that there I learned the degree and the importance and the gift and the and the of serving because we work the plantation without the expectation of being paid but we learn to serve uh, perfectionally my dad moved to Chicago in 1950 I was 12 years old I worked six years of my life on the plantation and I became involved with service That was before I was able to vote. In 1957, I went into the military and I served for 11 years. That's before I was able to vote. I was denied giving food in a public restaurant in a United States Army uniform, but that did not uh, deter me from serving. My wife and I moved 
to, to the city of Beaverton in 1995. She sits there with me, and she's been with me and for me for 53 years. When I came to Beaverton, I was looking for a place to continue my service. And I went to City Hall to find out what was available for my, my experiences. I have a quite uh, long resume and service experiences. And I joined the Human Rights Advisory Commission. I served there for, I think, 12, 13 years. I'm presently serving the, as the chairman of Neighborhood, Neighbor Southwest Neighborhood Association for nine years. I serve on the Oregon State Board of Dentistry as a public board member for, this is my fifth year. And I was elected last week to serve as the vice president for the Board of Dentistry. And so my, my uh, thought is I've been asked to, so why you choose to do this now? I said, well, now's the time. And I've never, I never allowed my present stand to determine where my tomorrow will be. I, 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 can't, I can't do that. I'm always looking for areas that I can give my life as service. If you would consider me, I wouldn't say over anyone, but along with the two other candidates, I will guarantee you, you two things you're going to get from me is total and absolute honesty and continuing to serve. When I'm called to serve, I don't choose to ask what their ethnic background might be or what their uh, any frame of religion or uh, anything. I, I go to serve. And if I'm seated on the Beaverton City Council, I think uh, one city, one purpose, one people with one purpose. Now thereby I mean, if we unify the city and the strength that we have, we speak about the diversity, which is a great wide range of diversity. If we bring that strength together on a forum and implement ideas to move forward, and I'm not saying the city is not moving forward, but just another leg, another idea in that form, I think we will make these things happen uh, more easily. One people, that's the people of Beaverton. It's not a segregated kind of situation. It's just one people moving together, charting out the, the desired course. And the purpose is to bring all ideas together that we can share these ideas. And one of the things I would like to focus on is, is the youth. Get the youth together and have them to bring ideas to us to, deter to find out what are you thinking about. Because when these young people graduate from college, I would not... I would rather them stay here rather than to move out to some places just to find jobs. We could find a way to have them create their own jobs. And so, ladies and gentlemen, thank you again. And if you choose either one of us, I think you've made a good choice. But I do ask that you would consider choosing me. Thank you very much. Folks, I'd like to just remind you of a few quick rules. If you could please ask your question in 30 seconds or less. Also, please announce who the question is for, if it's for one, two, or all three candidates. And candidates, please keep your responses to one minute or less if possible. We have about 15, 18 minutes for questions, so let's get rolling. Rob Solomon, please take it away. I'm Rob Solomon, forum member. Thank you guys for being here today. Appreciate it. To this point, City Council has chosen to take the middle of the road in the sense of middle of he who walked down the middle of the road get hit from both sides 
On the issue of medical marijuana dispensaries, I would appreciate hearing from all three candidates an actual policy and position on medical marijuana dispensaries in the city of Beaverton. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Mr. Solomon. I, um, my reply to that would be uh, I'm not in favor of dispensaries of medical marijuana. Uh, I think it would be a, a misjudgment. Uh, I am in favor of uh, the, the medical dispensing, but I think it should be in from a facility of a doctor, hospital, or, or pharmacy. But just to have that kind of availability, I think we're setting, setting forth a precedence for later on that our children, our young people, will just, it, it, I, I just don't have, I, that's not something that I, I would support. From a policy standpoint, some of the decisions already been made for the city council. 1531, which came out, created a an amazing legal quagmire. We no longer have the ability to ban medical marijuana facilities per se. But, and this is, bear with me, because this sounds complicated, because Beaverton and other communities around here implemented temporary bans. What the legislature now said is that, well, those bans no longer hold water, but you can institute a one-year ban if you act before May 1st. But, and, but if you want to limit that ban, you can, it has to be a year or not if you want to include that band. And that's not permanent, only for a year through next May of next year. But if you want to shorten it, you can shorten it, but first you have to vote for a year, then come back, and then re-vote after that's implemented for another temporary ban. So our ban goes through September. So if we wanted to ban it, we can't ban them outright. If we want to have a temporary ban, like we already did, so we could sort out the legislature, waiting for all the court cases and stuff, we have to implement a one-year moratorium, let it take effect, then re-vote to pull it back to our original idea of temporary moratorium. So there, medical marijuana facilities, unless there's another legislature mandate, and there's no coincidence that May of next year happens to go into the new legislative session. This is a compromise bill, has a lot of quirks. But they're coming to Beaverton, unless there's a state legislature doing it. The question is now how, and how we implement this new quirk on 1531. So as much as we may not want them in, in the neighborhood, they are going to come, so we've got to concentrate on how we cannot ban them outright. The state said, no, you can't. Well, we already got the lesson on that we cannot ban them outright. I think we're behind the eight ball because we didn't make decisions in a timely manner. In Beaverton, when we say we're open for business and when we say we lead the state, we have to mean it. And we had to have put these rules into effect before. So I'm a fan of allowing us to have the moratorium to sort through the legal decision on what we're going to do. And then, and because we can't ban them outright, so we need to prepare for business to open. Harry Bodine, forum member. Alton, it's good to see you again. The, uh, a neighbor of mine moved to Cedar Mill, and uh, he's really alarmed because across the creek from his house, between his house and Barnes Road, Valeria View Avenue Drive, the city is putting in 1,996 apartment units. Density, density, density. I look at that, incidentally, not a blade of grass around for, where a kid could go outdoors to play. Is this the Cedar Mill? We've got the Tufel Barracks building after building, and uh, is, is, is this Cedar Mill's future with Beaverton policy? That's a badly asked question. I apologize. But see what you guys can do with it. <laughs> we'll, we'll try again. <clears throat> 1,996 apartment units on a small piece of ground no place for children to play, and no, no Tualatin Hills Park within walking distance. Is this the future of Cedar Mill? I don't know if that's the future of Cedar Mills or not, but what I do have is a lot of friends that could help educate me on the topic, and I'd love to uh, 
get a, arm myself with a little more information and get back to you. The short answer is that's a single development. And if you're saying the future of an entire area, no. These developments as they come through, and that's part of why we have the whole the zoning and coding going, are in a context of development. So a particular development, are you going to say, is that going to be the future of everywhere? The short answer is no in that region. And these go through planning processes and planning plan reviews, and they come before the council if necessary, if someone has a contention with what the planning commission did. So I think it's a little too drastic to go on a, an extreme, say, is this the future of what's going to be entirely in that area? No. But it's sort of a stay tuned. And if you've got issues where you've got a concern about how a development is progressing, we do have avenues for you to come to the city. You can call us directly. I'll give you my card <laughs> if you want. The city, my city cell phone and the city office go straight to my cell phone, so there's no one in between us. I can happily chat with you about it. We can chat with the planning commission about it. But I think it's a little bit too much of a blanket statement to say, is this the future of everything that's going to ever be built in that area? The sure answer is no. Thank you for the question. And my response to that is, I came here because it gave me an opportunity to be, if you don't mind the word, free. Uh, this is the first place in my first time in my life that I've felt like a citizen and not like you other. And having said that, I think Beaverton before me have created the environment that will invite growth. And I don't think we can uh, uh, hinder growth, but I think if it's managed properly, we will prepare for those years to come because I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not hesitant, I'm, I'm very, respond to say we're not going to pre prevent growth, especially on a place like this, because everybody that I've known wanted to, wanted to come here. But if we start to put implement uh, progressions, uh, things in, in a progression, in a progressive way, uh, as, as the city grow and expand, uh, then we will be ready to uh, kind of usher that uh, growth in. I hope that will suffice your question, but that's the way I see that. Thank you very much. I'm uh, Bill Kroger, a forum member. First of all, I wanted to thank all three of you for taking the initiative to run. Appreciate it. Thanks for coming in today. The uh, closest uh, major arterial to where I live is uh, Schultz Ferry Road. And in the 10 years, uh, 11 years that we've lived there, I've just seen traffic get worse and worse all the time. Um, I, now we have a big, huge development being planned out on the West End, Roy Rogers and all that. I mean, hundreds and hundreds of homes. And their logical place to go is on Schultz Ferry. I'm not hearing anybody talk about traffic and what has to be done about it, and I was just wondering if you guys could address that issue. Actually, that, that issue has been brought up, and it scares the heck out of me. Um, we had a joint planning commission council meeting just last month, and uh, well, actually, no, it was this month. And uh, it is a big concern of mine because we're, most of the discussion is taking place when it comes to all the development of the new southern Beaverton. Um, I'm not worried. It's, it's basically concentrating on the area of Shoals Ferry, which goes through that. And that's going to create a heck of a lot of traffic for the existing Shoals Ferry. When I say basically, I'm not worried about what happens in and around that development. I'm not so much concerned about what happens with the traffic going west because we're planning to the extent we can. When you start going east of that development, past Murray Boulevard, I take that commute to, to my son's daycare every morning and back in the afternoon. It worries me. And we've talked a little bit about little things you can do and mitigating the traffic you know, signals and that. But that's mitigation. And that's something where it has been brought up at the planning commission level by multiple planning commissioners and myself. And it needs to be looked at, I agree, because it, it worries me long term. So, Commissioner King, will you stay there for a minute? I want to address this to you, Mike. I'm Karen Boland. Mm -hmm. Before you go, yes. Either of you yeah. have a response to the last question. Yeah. Oh, I'm we sorry. Equal time. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, roads are a really serious issue when we're talking about putting tons and tons of doors out in a community where there's not a lot of movement. 
I think there's a lot of things we have to consider. I think a lot of times people take the approach, well, everyone else could ride their bike and so get off the road so I could drive my car. But we need to do better at like community planning and movement. We have a really great max line that's underutilized now. We have bus routes that are underutilized now. We need to uh, incentivize citizens to use public transportation and you know work closer to home. One of the things that we could do to get people to work and live in the city is create a vibrant downtown core so people aren't commuting out of the city all the time to work or vice versa. We have a lot of people that live in Beaverton that commute outside of Beaverton or live in Portland and commute to Beaverton to work. To me, it seems like the issue we should be solving is how do we get people to live and work and stay in Beaverton? Yes, I am um, I'm also privileged to serve on the Commission of Traffic here in Beaverton. And these are some things that we brought uh, in a discussion. Uh, how are we going to address this ongoing issue? Well, I live right there in uh, that area. And we, we have uh, TVFNR and, and uh, all of the people that's concerned at our neighborhood association meetings. And, and these are some of the things we've been discussing on the local level as how this is going to be addressed and, and uh, the influx of the, the annexation of that Cooper Mountain uh, parcel over there is going to be enormous in, in traffic. And so those are some of the things that I, as the Neighborhood Association Chairperson, uh, and along with the serving on the Traffic Commission, we, we bring these things, and right now we're in discussion of how is this going to take place, and I don't have the answer when, but we are addressing that. Karen, your question, please. All right, so Commission, or Councilor King, this is for you. You addressed the group and talked about a Great Beaverton and a place for your son. I would like to hear from you, since you've served in the position, what do you think are your three greatest strengths of what you've added to the Beaverton Council? What, what has your contribution been in that great city plan? And, um, and I'd like to hear what, why we should elect you again. I think I said this before to smoke. My, the biggest thing I do is, and it, it's not on the council podium, is listen. I spend more time going out. One of my favorite things is uh, going out to different community events, whether it be business people and that, and just sitting back and listening. Um, this council podium offers a great forum um, for grandstanding sometimes, but I don't learn a lot by doing that. I learn a lot by listening to folks, and that to me is where I learn the most. And it's not the type of thing that puts you in a paper on the front line, but uh, being able to hear other, what other people are going on there and listening and uh, walking through the neighborhoods and just hearing what people say, that I think is my greatest strength that I take the time to do that. Um, after that, I mean, when it comes to the background and talents, I think, you know, my understanding of the, of the policies and fiscal nature of the city is one of the biggest things I can bring forward. I bring forward. I've got an unparalleled experience with fiscal matters on the city council. Oh, oh, I'm going to cut off. <laughs> Chris, last question. Thank you, Eric. Chris Leslie, former member. A simple question. What would each of you like, and maybe a, s a different answer from each, in our 21st century class shops in schools, what type of uh, benefits, what requirements, what improvements, anything along the lines of what is a 21st century shop class in high schools? Well, I'd be happy to answer that, but uh, it's not really what a city councilor does per se. But um, my husband uh, is probably one of the guys that shouldn't have gone to college right out of high school. He, uh, he went to uh, Central Oregon Community College and failed out and later joined the military and has since become an officer and gained his graduate degree. What I think the lesson we can learn out of that is that not everyone is designed for college right out of the chute. I coach young kids at Beaverton High School, and there are some kids that aren't meant for college right away. So what I think we need to do is prepare kids for trades better, 
And I've been working closely with four or five Beaverton school board members who have all endorsed me on how to get Beaverton off an island and get involved in stuff like this. The current moment, that's what I got for you. Well, I think um, if I might use a cliche, prepare for war at the time of peace. And I think uh, what we need to look to, look to the future by preparing our youth. It's, it's, it's kind of, you know, I, I seek counsel. Well, my wife, she was probably different with this. I, I try and speak less and listen more. That's where she's going to differ. But, but I, I listen to the echoes of our youth. And um, we've provided uh, steps in, in our community. We have a very vibrant community in the Progress Ridge uh, facility over there with the big owls bowling and all the businesses, which I was, I, I, that word I, I don't like to say I, I, I but we were very, uh, involved in getting that in. And so we do have meetings with young people and get ideas. So I think bringing young people together and getting ideas, I think we will find a, a, a soon solution to that. I think one of the things that city councilor does, even though it may not be technically in their job description on an issue like this, is the Council has an ability to form a very facilitating role. And to the point, and I agree with some of what was said here, there is, I was talking with a person from one of the local electrical unions a while back, and he said how much trouble they have recruiting people into his profession nowadays. And there is such a college focus that it sometimes has a tendency to exclude that there are other trades out there. And college isn't necessarily for everyone. I think we've, our president came out that the other day and was talking about that again where there are a tremendous amount of trades and things. And this is what, when I was in school, I'd say when I was in school back in the day, we had um, what we call, today might be called shop classes, but they were involved into machinists, electricians, carpenters, and it was considered part of a vocational training. And we didn't use those terms auto. there. Pardon? Auto. Auto, yes, I never took auto shop. I still can't change my own auto. But, <laughs> but those types of things are still things that we can work collaborating. This guy was talking with me from the electrical workers saying, you know, what can we do from the standpoint of, of the union in involving ourselves in this more. And the council can be a facilitator, if you, if you will. Thank you. Folks, we're done. Uh, thanks for the candidates for being here. Appreciate it. Come back in a week, and we'll see you then. Bye-bye.